Playdell was profoundly moved. From SAS Rogue Heroes, the authorized wartime history by Ben McIntyre. Dr. Malcolm James Playdell of the Royal Army Medical Corps had absolutely no idea what he was letting himself in for when he arrived at Cabrit in early June 1942. He had been told only that he would be attached to a unit operating in the desert commanded by a young daredevil officer. Everything is very hush-hush down there, the officer arranging his transfer had said. We never get to know anything at all, really. They're always dashing in and out on raids. Playdell was directed to a tent surrounded by sandbags. A tall and slender figure rose to greet him. The handshake was firm, though the hand was wrapped in dirty bandages. Ah, you'll play Del. By Jove, this is marvellous, having our own doctor. This is real luxury. By the way, have you had any lunch? No? Well, what about going over to the mess and having a drink? And then we can talk things over. As they strolled across the camp, Playdell could hear explosions in the distance. Most of the men, Sterling explained, would shortly be going out on a party and all those horrible bangs over on the beach when preparation for a series of night attacks on the coastal airfields. Paddy and myself have to go off at the end of the week. I know it must seem awfully rude of us to push off like this, just as you arrive. Playdell had been expecting a man of blood and steel, a ruthless trained killer. Instead, he had been made to feel as if he had just joined a particularly jolly beachfront house party with bombs. These men were risking their lives in particularly daring and spectacular fashion, but acting as if the whole thing was a glorious rag. Bladell decided he was going to enjoy being part of El Detachment, SAS. It did not take Malcolm Playdell long to realise that he had joined a most peculiar fighting unit. From the outside, this was a ruffianly, bearded, unkempt and ill-clothed mob. There was none of the spit and polish he had encountered and resented in the regular army units. The men treated their officers with a respect very different from the rote obedience required under traditional military discipline. These men were seldom impressed by what an officer said or the way he spoke. It was what he did that counted. Sterling treated all of his men with the same courtesy, never raising his voice or pulling rank. His authority seemed to stem from the quiet certainty of one who always got what he wanted and knew how to ask for it. There was about him a charm which it would be impossible to describe. And this, 
together with his personal modesty and his flattery of others, made him very difficult to deny. In the mess, seated on bar stools made from parachute container cylinders, Sterling's officers combined camaraderie with a spirit of personal competition, frequently expressed in physical roughhousing. If someone's trousers were not removed before the bar closed, you could be sure there was something wrong. Bill Fraser alone held back from the horseplay and was teased mercilessly for it. He seemed most relaxed in the company of his dog, Withers, who wore a naval coat and followed Fraser everywhere with deep and very soulful eyes. Worried that Italian reconnaissance planes might have identified the encampment at Caret Tartura, Sterling gave orders to relocate the forward base 25 miles west to a spot known as Bir el Quisair, a long low escarpment with numerous fissures and gullies, ideal for concealing the vehicles. For the next month, this would be SAS's desert home. The raids continued. On the night of the 11th of July, a party under Maine destroyed at least 14 planes at El Daba. Jordan wrecked eight more at Fuca. But while the tally mounted, so did the toll. The day after Maine's raid, a patrol led by a dashing LRDG officer named Robin Gurdon, identified by Sterling as a possible second in command, came under attack from Italian fighters. Gurdon was shot through the stomach and chest and died before Pleidel could reach him. The doctor had come to know Gurdon well and felt his loss keenly. The men almost never talked about their dead comrades. You could never show your true feelings on the subject, Playdell noted. But when no one was looking, he wept. How strange the desert war seemed, he wrote. The way we travelled over vast tracts of wilderness in order to search out and kill one another. In the desert camp, an oddly peaceful, almost domestic routine developed. The doctor set up a makeshift surgery in a small cave where the men came to be treated for desert sores and other ailments. To while away the hours, he made a study of the local fauna, such as it was, snakes, scorpions, and the occasional howling jackal at night. Paddy Main wore a sleepy grin as he lay in the shadow of his jeep, reading a penguin and flicking away the occasional fly. Playdell saw that he was reading the Spanish Farm Trilogy by Ralph Hale Mottram, First World War novels depicting an oasis of calm in the midst of a brutal war. Sterling spent the quiet hours happily reliving the recent raids and planning the next ones. Lying beneath the belly of a three-ton lorry on his back with one leg crossed languidly over the other, sucking peacefully on his empty pipe, for all the world as if he was discussing the form of a point-to-point. -point. Sterling never relaxed his dress code, 
whether going into battle or unwinding after it, he always wore a tie. The men chattered idly in the heat, using a shared jargon weighted with euphemism, black humour and profanity. A private language unintelligible to a stranger. Heading into the desert was going up the blue. A raid was a party or jolly. Grumbling was ticking. Sinking into sand was crash diving or periscope work. One night around the campfire, after a dinner of bully beef stew, someone opened an extra bottle of rum. As it grew darker, the men began to sing, at first slightly self-conscious and shy, but picking up confidence as the song spread. Their songs were not the martial chants of warriors, but the schmaltzy, romantic, popular tunes of the time. I'll never smile again. My melancholy baby, I'm dancing with tears in my eyes. The bigger and burlier the singer, Playdell noted, the more passionate and heartfelt the singing. Now the French contingent struck up with a warbling rendition of Madeleine, the bittersweet song of a man whose lilacs for his lover have been left to wilt in the rain. Then it was the turn of the German prisoners who, after some debate, belted out Lily Marlene, the unofficial anthem of the Africa Corps, complete with harmony. Vorder Kazerne, Vordem Grossen Tor, Stand eine Lantern, und stent sie noch davor. Usually rendered in English as Underneath the lamplight, by the barrack gate. Darling, I remember how you used to wait. As the last verse died away, the audience broke into loud whistles and applause. To his own astonishment, Playdell was profoundly moved. There was something special about that night, he wrote years later. We had formed a small solitary island of voices, voices which faded and were caught up in the wilderness. A little cluster of men singing in the desert, an expression of feeling that defied the vastness of its surroundings. A strange body of men thrown together for a few days by the fortunes of war. The doctor from Lewisham had come in search of authenticity and he had found it deep in the desert among hard soldiers singing sentimental songs to imaginary sweethearts in three languages. <laughs>